Hey everybody, Ed Holmwood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. I hope everyone's doing well today. Today's video is a little bit of a discussion about Delta Sigma DAX and a little bit of a rant about DAX and how, in my estimation, the, the last several generations of DAX have little or no impact on the quality of sound, with the exception of one new topology that just came out that I'm still investigating and haven't made a conclusion on, and that's the AKM 4499 two-chip chipset, which is kind of a hybrid, I guess, between Delta Sigma and Art R. When I do the review of the deck I have in with that chipset, I'll be able to explain what that is, but I'm still in the beginnings of that. So I was thinking about DACs and all of the DACs that are in our world, and I have 50 DACs in my house, and it's amazing because they're ubiquitous now. So I have five TVs with DACs, two fuzzy little Bluetooth amplifiers DACs. I have two Google Nest products. There's one back there on the lamp. Three DVD players, four, five CD players, four receivers that have DAC chips, four cell phones all have DAC chips, five tablets and an iPad, six standalone DACs, five PC monitors with built-in speakers. They have a DAC for the HDMI input, 10 PCs, laptops, etc. two dongle DACs, two sound bars, three Bluetooth receivers, a Chromebook, and a partridge in a pear tree. So it got me thinking about DACs. I started my journey with outboard DACs. My first outboard standalone DAC was I bought in 1988. It was a Marantz CDA-94, and it was a magnificent beast. And in those days, there were only a few companies doing outboard DACs. Uh, Wadia Digital, uh, Theta Digital, Mike Moffat, uh, Marantz, Philips, and a couple others. And a lot of people, like Paul McGowan at PS Audio, were modifying existing uh, Magnavox, which were Philips, and Philips CD players with better analog stages. And we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. So most of those, all those early DACs were chip-based R to R DACs. It was later in the mid nineties that what was called Bitstream, which is really Delta Sigma, started to become more popular and more ubiquitous and it was lower cost and that's why it uh, grabbed hold. So I, you see that the frequency in which new DAC chips are coming out reminds me of the frequency which Intel used to introduce CPU chips. Now granted, you know, for, there are a lot of applications where power is really important, but for the average user like me, you know, I surf the internet, I do some email, uh, you know, watch YouTube videos, write some scripts for YouTube videos, do, uh, you know, some banking, online bill paying, things like that. For me, the power of the CPU stopped being a, a, a relevant factor seven, eight years ago when I bought the machine I have. It's still plenty fast. So why all the new chips all the time? Well, they, there's got to be an enticement to get you to go buy a new product. I mean, they are in business to make money after all. And I think DAC chips are in that realm right now. I think it's to the point now where the last several years, three, four years worth of DAC chips are all so good that it's not the chip anymore that really determines the sound quality of a DAC product. So if you go to uh, Audio Science Review, Amir does a great job and he measures hundreds of DACs. And if you look at his bar graph, of all the DACs he's measured and where they fall, there is a large proportion of those devices he's tested that all fall within a very narrow circle of performance. And my fear is, is that you've got DAC chip designers chasing this Synad measurement to the, to the exclusion of worrying about sound quality. And it happened uh, back in the 80s with receivers. Everybody was chasing THD. Uh, because, you know, that was a nice advertisable feature that could get consumers to come buy stuff when, in fact, it doesn't matter what the THD of your amplifier is because your speakers are greater than 2 or 3%. So, but it was something for consumers to latch onto, and I get that. And so new stuff has to be introduced to entice us to buy new stuff, all right? And I think that's where we're at with DAC chips. But I think, again, if you look at the measurements from Amir's website, a lot of those chips, even three, four-year-old chips, still... I mean, performance-wise are so close to current chips that I think it's an immaterial thing. I think it's not the chip anymore. I think it's the overall design of the entire device that's really important. And so let's talk about that. I mean, all DAC chips have super high signal and noise ratio. They have super high resolution, 32 bits, 768, even though there's nothing out there at that range. DSD 512, even though there's nothing out there. Um, they all ha have great dynamic range. So the chip isn't the determining factor. I think the things that are really important are the power supply, the circuit design and grounding design, the analog section, and then the clock. So for power supplies, a lot of the, the inexpensive 
fun five decks come with the outboard power supplies or you use a phone charger kind of power supply five volt those are switching power supplies and they switch back and forth at really high speed and that noise while the the, the power supply is not in the box which is good it's x it, it is external but it can still send noise up that power cable and that can affect the the performance of the deck now you don't hear it as noise most of the noise things i'm going to be referring to aren't actual audible as a noise, like a buzzing sound or scratchy sound or whatever. But what they do is they raise the noise floor. And when you raise the noise floor, you mask the finer detail in the audio signal that you're listening to. So when myself or other reviewers talking about a unit having a very dark, very you know, opaque background, that means low noise floor. That means that fine detail can come through. So again, a lot of the noises I'm going to talk about are part of that noise floor. So the power supply design, linear power supplies are far quieter than uh, linear power supplies. Although all power supplies, in, in, uh, voltages coming in need to be filtered through uh, coupling, decoupling capacitors. Then we have grounding and layout. We want to make sure that each of the circuit areas that have our task with a specific job, the DAC, the analog section, the clock, you know, the buffers, so forth, are grounded properly so that you don't create a ground loop or ground hum, again, contributing to that noise floor. So that's really important. And then the layout, we want to make sure that a circuit that can be noisy is not near a circuit that's susceptible to noise. And again, reducing the ground, the, the noise floor. Um, really the big deal for me is the analog section and the clock. In the analog section, all digital analog converter, converted signals need to be filtered. And if you're converting 16 uh, bit 441 kilohertz, you have to have a filter at 22,000 hertz. Boom, brick wall. And it's, it's based on what's called the Nyquist frequency, half the sampling rate. The problem is a poorly implemented brick wall filter can create artifacts that get into the audible frequencies that we hear below 22,000 hertz. And again, it's not an audible noise per se, it is noise floor. It's a masking of detail. It's a loss of resolution. It's a bass note that doesn't impact the way it really should. Those things can happen because of that brick wall filtering. <clears throat> now, we can oversample, but are you really oversampling? And do you know if you're oversampling? Now, the good news is <clears throat> high res files are becoming more and more available. And so if we go to 24 bit 96 kilohertz, we move that sample frequency that that based on that Nyquist frequency out to 48 kilohertz, which means rather than a brick wall, we can have a much more gentle slope and any of the artifacts of that filtering are so below the noise level that they never really make it back into the audible spectrum. So that's a very good thing, but your DAC can oversample. How do you access that? Let me talk about that in a, in a minute and remind me to do that. The other part of it too is in the analog section is where the designer, a, a, a well-designed circuit the designer can voice the unit to have a sound signature that they're going after, a warmer sound, a more detailed sound, etc. You get what I mean. The next thing, though, is the clock. And jitter is a big issue. Jitter is are timing issues in the data stream. And uh, these days, with most streamer DACs in one box, the jitter issues are less of an issue because they're communicating internally. Um, where with our outboard DACs, when we communicate with the outside world, we have to do it in one of three ways. We have to do it via USB or Toslink SPDIF or coax SPDIF. Now, <clears throat> SPDIF is nice. It was stands for Sony Digital, uh, Sony Philips Digital Interface, and it was developed a million years ago when CDs were invented. And it's only for audio, and it's not a very wide pipe, and it's nice because it's a lossless transmission, but it's not error free, and it can run long long distances, and that's and that's good. Um, the problem with SPDIF, Toslink or coax is that the device that's sending the signal, it's that clock that determines the timing of the information, not the clock in the DAC. Now, there can be errors and there are errors in SPDIF transmissions, no question about it. So the DAC has to chase this clock. If there's a dropout in information, the DAC has to use what's called CIRC error correction. And I'll put what that means down here. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what it means, something interleaved Reed Solomon error correction. Anyway, the DAC chases the clock and there's always going to be a problem. Well, error correction is not perfect. It looks at the, at the data before, the data after, and tries to interpolate it. So it's guessing. So again, the source device determines the clock timing. The DAC chases that timing. So it's great for CD players and it's great for most of us. And I use it all the time on my CD players and things like that. 
Um, I also happen to like it because it's, it's a relatively low noise. It's, uh, if you use optical, it's not susceptible to RFI. So anyway, the, then there's USB and it's asynchronous USB. And that probably is the best for most of us. Now, again, if we're using a, a combination DAC streamer, we don't have to worry about that connection because it's occurring internally and it's probably I squared S. We'll talk about that in a second. But anyway, a, a lot of us use PCs, our laptop, a MacBook, um, uh, a Mac Mini, uh, to for our streaming services, you know, to play our title or Cobuzz or Spotify or whatever it is. USB is asynchronous, which means it's bidirectional. The nice thing about USB is the DAX clock takes care of the timing, not the source. So the quality of your clock in your DAC is really important at that point. And the, the jitter reduction is huge. It's so much better. Again, the clock in the DAC determines the timing, not the sending device, not that PC or whatever. And because it is asynchronous and bidirectional, if the uh, DAC detects a dropout, a, a corrupted packet, it can ask for that packet to be resent and correct that information with the proper information, not guessing through uh, error correction circuitry. So asynchronous is really good. And there are a lot of, there are some newer uh, CD transport product like the shit erd that are coming out with the asynchronous USB connection. Again, because it is for, mo for most of us, the very best connection it is. Now with USB, depending on what you're doing, if you're playing your title or Cobuzz apps on your computer, they're great. And they'll give you the high res and everything else, but they won't let you determine the sampling rate. The file will. If you use a program like I think Rune does it, although don't hold me to that. I know Artivana does it and everyone who knows me knows I love Artivana. And I think Jay River can do it. Those software uh, applications can talk to the DAC directly. I know in Artivana, I can tell the DAC that I've got a 1644 file, but I want it upsampled two times or power of two times two times four or whatever the maximum frequency of my device is. 24192 or 32768 or whatever, I can tell the DAC what I want the sampling rate to be. And that's really good. Again, I don't do much beyond 2496 because again, it moves that Nyquist, that filtering further out and makes it less audible in the audible range of frequency. So that's an important thing. I squared S is the internal communication that a DAC uses internally. And again, with a good streamer, uh, good streamer DAC combination, you don't have to worry about that communication level and jitter is greatly reduced because of that. Then there's AES EBU, which is basically just spit off with a different connector. And again, the sending device is, is the, is the uh, primary clock, not the, not the DAC, not the receiving device. So what's the takeaway? The takeaway is you want to buy a DAC, not based on the chip, but based on your perception of the company's engineering or design philosophies their track record in, in providing very high quality products, maybe based on some of us YouTube reviewers discussions and how we describe the sound signature. If it sounds like something you're looking for, then maybe pursue it and, and based on, on price. But I will tell you to do it right for a, for a standalone DAC unit, you're going to be in that five, 600 plus price range to get a really good quality uh, DAC unit. And if you're doing a streamer DAC, um, again, you're going to be in that $500 plus dollar price range. The best value streamer DAC combination I can think of right now. I mean, obviously Eversolo has some neat product. I don't have a ton of experience with it. Um, the Cambridge uh, MXN 10 and AXN 10 at 500 bucks. Great combination. Great streamer. Do not discount the, the, the importance of a quality streamer. You're not going to get the same kind of sound out of one of these little entry level devices, even though they're very nice and they're great to get started. But for a DAC streamer, you're going to be you know, up in that same six, seven hundred dollar price range and preferably to really do it right. You're going to be up uh, of a thousand or more dollars really to get it properly done right with a good quality streamer and then a really good quality DAC. And then we didn't talk about <coughs> different DAC topologies like R to R multi bit, like my shit by frost unit. Our, our ladder, like a Denifrips Aries or a Gustard or uh, a, a Ladder Schumann or FPGA, like you find in uh, Brooklyn and Cord and, and uh, I think the Mola Mola DACs use FPGA, which is just a programmable circuit that you can program a DAC into and make it do what you want. So those are the things that I would recommend you look for. 
the fun five stuff, the entry level stuff, it you know it works well now, um, but it's going to be the limiting factor as you improve your system. So I am one of these source first guys. The first link of the chain is that got to be the strongest link because if it if it's output and garbage, that's all you're going to get through the rest of the system. And I will tell you that with a really good quality DAC or DAC streaming product, your amp will scale up, your speakers will scale up, your whole experience will be better. It is far better to have a better DAC or better DAC streamer combo or a better turntable and better cartridge than it is to have expensive speakers and a cheap amp and a cheap source. Honestly, after doing this for as many years as I have, I can recommend that. So again, manufacturer, you know, who, who would you look at? Obviously, I think uh, the top of the line SMSL and topping DACs are really good. Gustard DACs, again, up over that five $600 price range are very good products. Shit makes some great products. I mean, I love, I've got a hot rotted Bifrost multi-bit I've had for years. That's my reference that I love. Um, I think Cambridge makes great DAC product. Um, there are a couple out there. I'm not familiar with all of them, but oh, Gashelli Labs, uh, that's actually the DAC I've got in for review that's caused me to think about all of this stuff. Buy from them, you're going to get good quality product. I mean, the folks at Cashelli, their their design, their board design and their layout, like Cambridge, like shit, like Gustar, like the top of the line topping in SML, they look at the design of the DAC. Every part of it becomes an integral uh, component in how they can mip, manipulate it to get the best sound possible. And those are the products that I would highly recommend. So anyway, I'm done with my rant. If you like the video, please give me a like, please subscribe, I'd appreciate it. Um, please comment. Any of you who have commented, no, I read them all, I respond to them, <clears throat> and I love the, the conversation back and forth. Uh, I get to learn a lot about you guys and hear about your experiences and, and so forth. And sometimes someone has a question and hopefully I can answer it. And if I don't have the answer, I promise you I'll find you a source to get the right answer. I'm not going to make something up. I don't do that. Um, so I do appreciate the comments. Full disclosure, in the description below in the video, there are some affiliate links from Amazon. If you were to purchase something, I do make a small commission, but it does not affect your price, nor does it affect your ability to return a product if you were dissatisfied with it. Also, further down the list are a bunch of playlists on Tidal, Kobuz, and Spotify. I'd love to see what you think of the music. I listen to some crazy stuff. I'm all over the place, and you know, I, I want to share that. That's why I did some of those videos, kind of playlist videos, and I got some more of those coming uh, that I'm going to do. So again, Thank you so very much. I'm so grateful for your time. I'm so grateful for your thumbs up. I'm so grateful for your subscription. And please enjoy yourself and listen to music. This is Ed Holmwood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel, signing off. <laughs>